Okay, so talk to us a little bit about how the approach that you guys use and the research you've done, um, how does this work for type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes? Does it benefit both and what results have you seen? Well, it clearly benefits type 2. I mean, we, we've seen that very clearly going back to our first study on this was published back in 1999. And in 2003, we got a good grant, a very generous grant from the U.S. government to put this to the test. And the, the, this is for type 2 diabetes. The reduction in hemoglobin A1c in people on the conventional diet, the, the sort of calorie counting, uh, conventional, what we used to, used to call an ADA diet, not a very fair characterization, but that's what we used to call it. Um, their A1C drop was 0 0.4, uh, which is good. Um, the drop in A1C on the low fat vegan diet was 1.2. Um, so three times better. And we just started having to back people off their medications. And I got to tell you, this is the first time I'd ever seen something. I will never forget. I had a, a participant who had been a policeman and he told me how diabetes was all up and down his family tree. And he said, if I keep, his, his A1C was nine and a half. He says, if I keep going this direction, I'm going to probably go blind. I'm going to lose a leg. Well, he went vegan and he said, you know, this is the easiest diet I ever, ever could do. And I thought, wait a minute, easy. People think of it as like, You've got to acquire a taste for folk music, you know, <laughs> um, you know start wearing tie dye because you're vegan. He said, no, 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 no. He says, it's easy. Instead of meat chili, I have a bean chili. Instead of ground beef on my spaghetti, I have the tomato sauce. This is simple. You don't make me count. You don't tell me to, to cut my portions. You don't tell me to go to bed hungry. None of that stuff. And, and anyway, the point I'm making is that a year later, I got his, A1C. He, he had started out at nine and a half and he was 5.3. And in the interim, his doctor had stopped all his medication. And I thought, wait a minute. He's got an A1C of 5.3 and he's not on anything at all. And it suddenly hit me. He could go into any clinic anywhere and they wouldn't diagnose him as having diabetes. And I thought, type two diabetes, we have been way, way too modest in our treatment about this. And I, I don't know if you know this, but. My, my dad grew up in the cattle business, didn't like it, left, went to medical school, became the diabetes expert for Fargo, North Dakota. And he'd come home every day and sit down in his bag. And I never heard him say ever that diabetes ever went away or even improved that much. And I thought, oh my God, it's, it's, you know, because we just, we were focusing on medications to knock it down, not focusing on the patient and helping the patient to eat in such a way that the disease process can be reversed. I think modest is an accurate characterization, characterization in the sense that it's not taken seriously enough, uh, you know, especially pre-diabetes for sure. Right. And a lot of people, I've had so many phone calls with people who are interested in joining our coaching program. I get to learn a lot through those calls. And people saying how, oh, my doctor didn't even tell me I was pre-diabetic for a certain period of time. They only brought it up once I became type two. It's like even the doctor, wasn't seeing that this is serious. I need to, you know, help them make some changes and believe that they could do those changes. It's completely missing in the system. Yeah, uh, doctors really owe it to the patient to, to to give the patient a pathway to wellness and not be skeptical. Oh, the patient won't do it. The patient is too addicted to whatever. That may be your value. It's not necessarily their values. A lot of patients want to keep their eyesight. Um, they want to be healthy. They don't want to be in line at the pharmacy counter. So they, they want that. Now you asked about type one. Um, with type one, we need more studies to see the extent to which a low fat plant based, based diet can be effective. But here's what we think. Um, if you've got type one diabetes, needless to say, um, we're focusing on the pancreas. It's no longer making insulin the way we need it to. Um, but that's only half of it. The insulin that I'm administering it's got to go somewhere and it's going to the muscle cells, just like insulin that could have been made in your pancreas. Um, it's going to the liver cells and those muscle and liver cells might be packed with fat, just like they would in a type two, a person with type two. So what that means is if I'm no longer having my ham and cheese sandwich with mayo and I'm going on a plant-based diet and the fat is dissipating from my muscle cells, that happens fast. And that may mean that my insulin requirement is going to drop and it might drop very, very rapidly. Now we need more time to, to 
quantify this. Um, and we need more research to do this. But I think it's the, it is the future of, of type 1 diabetes research is to see how we can use a diet to help our bodies to be as, as healthy as they can be. And that means being insulin sensitive, allowing our, our bodies to respond to the insulin we're using. And I will bet you dollars to donuts that um, we're going to greatly be able to greatly reduce the insulin requirements that people may have. I'm very glad to see that your organization is doing this research on a very high level. And we can certainly share from our perspective, as Cyrus and I both living with type 1 and the thousands of people who've been through our coaching program, that uh, what you're saying does happen. And people living with type 1 diabetes become insulin sensitive very quickly. And they do need a reduction in insulin requirements, usually about 60% or so in the first three months, while either doubling or tripling their carbohydrate content. That's what we see regularly. But I think, you know, it's, we can't do an interview with you, Dr. Barnard, without you having just doing your explanation of what is insulin resistance and why are the foods that you're recommending in this interview making people more insulin sensitive? Well, insulin resistance really just means that the cells, particularly the, I, I think about the muscle cells, but it's also the liver cells, that they're just not responding to insulin like they, they ought to be. The insulin is there, it's in your blood, and it physically attaches to a receptor on the surface of the cell. And it's like a key in a lock. It's hopefully opening up that cell membrane to allow, to allow the glucose to come inside. But if the fat has built up inside the cell, the insulin will still attach to the surface of the cell, but it's like a, a lock filled with chewing gum. The key just can't turn the lock. The insulin key can't open that cell. And that's why our focus is on getting the fat out. This intramyocellular lipid fat in a muscle cell or hepatocellular lipid fat in a liver cell. If I can get that out of the cell by making diet changes, then the insulin key that is, the insulin key that is now attached to the cell can work again. It can accept the sugar from the bloodstream and your blood sugar falls. And it makes such a world of a difference when you can do that. And insulin sensitivity is, as you'll hear throughout the summit, is tied to so many different conditions.